Hey guys, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news in the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Mark Ellis. Welcome, one and all, to the best movie news show in the entire galaxy. We got fun and games. My name is Mark, and on today's show, Bond has a short list, and dragons join Han Solo. <laughs> kind also, of. Also, Natasha, who's joining me today? Also joining us, Mark Riley. Hey, I like that reference, Mark Ellis. That's nice. It was just for you. Thank mm -hmm. you. And uh, I can't wait. This is a good show. Going to be a lot of uh, we all float here uh, puns. <laughs> also joining us, Jeremy Johns. We don't float, Riley, but if you follow us here, you'll float too. There it is. <laughs> And also joining us, the lovely Clark Wolf. Hiya, Georgie. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Good to see you. I'm very excited today, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> yeah, I am very excited. And if it looks like we're floating on air, it's because we <laughs> just saw the new trailer for It. So before we get to this rundown right here, we have the new It trailer that just dropped this morning. That some people got a chance to check out last week at Comic-Con. But for the rest of us civilians, Jeremy <laughs> just saw this scary clown. He's talking. There's stuff in sewers. And this movie looks pretty damn terrifying and also really good. Yeah, uh, if you look at that picture, if we could pull it up again, that's what I look like when I do complicated math. Like that, that is complex math right there. I just kind of, I blank out with my, my doughy, creepy eyes and I'm just, I'm gone. That's half, half the time you throw a question to me, Mark, that's also what I look that like. Is, that, that is you yeah, discovering funny. the Z plane in 10th grade. Like, wait, we're going 3D with this? Oh boy. Exactly. But uh, no, the, the trailer was good. I fell off the wagon so hard. I was reading the book and the book is a bit of a tome. But I got, uh, <laughs> people were like, how, how far did you get? I was like, about 150 pages in, which is respectable for any other book. That's halfway through. Not a Stephen King book. I got past the intro, and now we're all going to the town. But it's really intriguing. So I hope this movie keeps with the intrigue rather than the, ooh, scary clown jump scare. It's not really about that. It's about the the mystery and the, and the terror and the fear. That's right. Now, I will defer to uh, my horror counterparts here. I just don't know who to go to first. Go to that so guy. Riley is just, you were so excited. You were like a, a kid at Christmas, a really scary, blood-filled Christmas when this trailer dropped. Did it live up to your expectations? Uh, it absolutely did. And this is the actual Comic-Con trailer that I saw where I got a special sneak peek. Uh, Perry and I went. We hung out with the cast. We saw two clips from the movie and then wow. the trailer in a packed audience at San Diego uh, Comic-Con. And it did not disappoint. This trailer, watching it with a crowd in a movie theater... G gave you a little bit of a hint of what the audience experience is going to be. It was phenomenal. I love this. The progression of the You'll Float 2 that Georgie is saying is kind of the worst thing in the world in the best way for a horror fan. I can't wait. The book looks like it's coming to life. It's the book that I read in high school that I fell in love with that I'm about to put on the audio book again. I cannot wait. <laughs> This trailer did it all for me. Uh, apparently, Clark, the audiobook clocks in at 44 hours, which I don't know if I will be alive that long, so I will not be investigating the book anytime soon. <laughs> but as far as this trailer looks, I love the... the What Riley brought up is that the You'll Float Down Here Too mm -hmm. and the Georgie, come on, Georgie, come play with us. That is so much more terrifying than when trailers put in like an old song and they like slow it down yes. and it's like, oh, this is a pop song. We're going to sing it in a new way. Let's stop with that and let's have more of these kind of trailers because this was genuinely... Genuinely terrifying. I like the weird cameo of the balloon at floating out of the, the Warner Brothers logo. So everything about this trailer hooked me. I don't need to see any more from this movie. You got my money. September cannot get here fast enough. Yeah, totally. I, first of all, speaking of the audiobook, I have 14 hours left in my nice. second go-round this wow. year. If, nice. I'm not, if that's not a nerd, I don't know what is. <laughs> um, but uh, look, I um, I am a big fan of the of the novel and the source material. And I know that you know if you grew up in a certain time, you have a fond affection for the Tim Curry TV miniseries. But the truth is that Stephen King's novel is a is a really mature adult um, hard R kind of adaptation. And while, yes, Tim Curry is fantastic in the miniseries, don't look at this as a remake. This is not a remake of a TV miniseries on network television. This is a true adaptation of a novel. I know we don't, I don't think we officially have the rating yet, but this is a hard R if I've ever seen one. I mean, I don't think they're trying to goof off with some PG-13 rating here. And as they should, this should be a hard R. But the two things that really stood out to me from this trailer are is 
the way that it's almost reminiscent of Stand By Me, you know, they're really, and that at the core of this novel is what it's about. It's about being a kid. That's what's scary. Yes, there is an interdimensional clown being that wants to rip your <laughs> arm off. But in addition to that, being a kid is scary and growing up is scary. And I think that you're seeing just from these quick glimpses that they're really honing in on that. And the second thing is, as somebody who is a fan of the novel, I am seeing not only the novel on the screen, but new stuff too. In the book, at the end of this new trailer, there is that clown room where Finn Wolfhard walks into a room full of clowns. Guess what, y'all? That ain't in the book. So I think what's cool about that is you have something for all fans. Fans who love the novel and the source material could potentially get something that's really exciting and a true adaptation. But even if you haven't seen it, you get, you're going to get some new scares too. So this trailer has me absolutely sold. Yeah, they add a little bit of new mythology to what we already have with it. And as I was talking about on Schmoes last night, one of my favorite parts about the miniseries is you just get this nice group of kids and they have to go up against these bullies in addition to this other menace. So there's a real like the Sandlot feel to it. Totally. And I like that this movie is just about them as kids that maybe if we do a sequel, we'll have them as adults revisiting it. But right now it's just kids. So it's a lot like the Sandlot if you replace the Beast and Wendy Peppercorn with a killer clown <laughs> from outer space. <laughs> just a little tweak in there. Baseball summertime fantasy. All right, let's move on to our first official story. Natasha, what do we got? Okay, according to a report from Deadline, three names have emerged as the frontrunners to direct Bond 25. Producers for Eon and MGM have reportedly zoned in on arrivals Denis Villeneuve, 71's Jan Demange, and Hell or High Water's David McKenzie to tackle the next 007, with the New York Times saying Daniel Craig is likely to sign on for one more go-around. However, soon after Deadline's story dropped, Variety chimed in with their report saying it's 71's Jan Demange, who is the choice to helm the picture. Eon and MGM just recently tweeted out an announcement saying that the next movie in the series will land in theaters on November 8th, 2019. Mark, what are your thoughts on the short list of directors for Bond 25? Well, this short list does not include Sam Mendes, who did the previous two, and I think that's a nice call because as much as I'm a fan of his entire uh, catalog, I think that we always need fresh energy injected from a directorial standpoint in these Bond movies. So with Bond 25, none of those names sound bad to me, but I really liked 71 with Jan Dimaj, and I think that if he can take that sort of real gritty feel to Bond. That's what we got with Casino Royale, and that's why a lot of people fell in love with that reboot, is that it felt like a different Bond. We got some of the classic mainstays, but it also felt like a different spin on it, a more raw, gritty Bond. That is what we want from our Daniel Craig James Bond movie, so I think Jan Demange, if he goes on to be the director, is a fantastic choice, and it's something that I would get excited about, a fresh injection of energy into this franchise. Riley, what's your take on this shortlist? Well, I mean, the one name that stands out for me is Denis Villeneuve, uh, but he's not going to do this. He's going to do Dune next. That's his passion project. So automatically when I saw him, look, every time there's going to be a new movie coming out, a big blockbuster, be it a Bond, be it a new comic book movie, be it a, even a Star Wars movie, the short list is going to include Denis Villeneuve. I think everybody's going to go after this guy, but I, I'm so glad he's going to go do Dune. My next choice would be Hell or High Water director. Uh, why can't I? David McKenzie. David McKenzie. I'm um, here for you. Hell, yeah, thank you. Uh, Hell or High Water, what a fantastic movie. And that kind of um, sensibility behind that picture, put, like, it's, it's, a, it's like a gritty Western. To put it in the Bond franchise is very fascinating to me. But then when I read Variety's article, Jan Demange is the front runner, and that sounds like a perfect fit because of everything I've heard from 71. Haven't seen it. I need to see it. I need to get into this guy's stuff so if that's the, what they're going for and i've heard nothing but good things about 71 then sounds good to me it's pretty intense now jeremy when we get to directors named Jan de something we got a pretty good one who made speed once upon a time Jan Dimash <laughs> could be making bond 25 or we could have somebody else on that short list who would you draft well uh i i agree with you about uh, uh denny villeneuve being uh, doing dune you know a lot of times you hear directors like uh, like you said his name's going to be thrown out a lot yeah. And so he's going to do one out of ten of these things that he's on the short list for. Uh, glad he's doing Dune. I just looked up uh, Jan Demange. Mm -hmm. Jan Demange. Yeah, yeah, Jan Demange. I like I, how I was, you held that. That yeah, was very I, I, I was, I was waiting for. I was waiting for Ellis to go like that, and I was going to course correct. You know, that's what you do when you don't. You're like, maybe that's the great. Glad I stuck the landing on the name. And it was official. I have not seen a thing that dude's done, so I can't even speak on it. But uh, Heller High Water director... 
David McKenzie. That's the one. <laughs> where, um, yep. I find that interesting because that's a character piece. That's a hard character piece. And to bring that to Bond, I agree, could be that fresh take that we got when we first saw, uh, first saw Casino Royale. And I do agree that, I mean, a as... I, I love the catalog of the Daniel Craig Bonds thus far. The last one, Spectre, kind of fell off the rails a bit. And, I mean, that's, that's the time where you're like, all right, it's time to move on. Thank you for your service, sir. But it's time to go elsewhere with a director. All of these directors, they, they do fascinate me. The, the ones I, I, two out of three that I actually know. I would go for uh, Mr. Hell or High Water. David McKenzie. That's his name. I would go with him. Uh, Clark, this movie is set for release November 8th, 2019. So let's say you and me are competing in a movie trivia showdown in 2022, and somebody asks us, who directed Bond 25? Who do you think the correct answer should well, be? Well, considering that you've said all of their names 400 times today, <laughs> I think basically you're practicing for this inevitable showdown. It's question. definitely going to be a question, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, you know, I don't know. And, and the reason is because the Broccoli family who control controls uh, Bond, they are notoriously um, conservative with this character, meaning they they don't really want to push outside the boundaries too much. We all know, you know, uh, there is a big fan groundswell for Idris Elba, and, you know, they, they kind of pushed back and said, no, 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 and, and you know, um, in terms of casting Bond, they're very particular, and so I wonder with a David McKenzie, let's say, if that sort of, you know, we like it the way we like it would sort of hinder his ability to get this directing job because I think someone like a David McKenzie is very different than maybe the last handful of directors who have come before. And as far as Villeneuve, I mean, he, as, as has already been said on the panel, but I think it's important to mention, this guy is a sci-fi nerd and this, and now that he is starting to get the acclaim for, for his work, if he's going to get, get, going to get to make Blade Runner all day, he's going to make Blade Runner, Blade Runner all day. If he's going to want to make Dune all day, he's going to do that. I don't see him really stepping into this into this universe and as far as um Jan de Mange, uh, I, I haven't seen his work either. And to be honest with you, I actually didn't even know his name. And I mm -hmm. usually I try to stay pretty up with this stuff. So so to me, this one was kind of a surprise. But if he's a front runner, I think, you know, um, he's a front runner for a reason. And I think the Broccoli's are going to be very, very particular with who they choose. Right. It's a good point you make about the Broccoli family because it's almost like you're going into a Lucas film or a DC or a Marvel where they have a set way that they want to do things. And so if you're a director, you you have to check some of your independence at the door and come in and work with a team and not just go off and make the movie that you yourself have a singular vision for. I wonder, I, sorry to interject, but I just, I wonder because, you know, we all know that Daniel Craig has been very resistant to mm -hmm. come back. And so I wonder if he'd actually have some say in this because for him to come back and sign on to do this, they got to be giving him pretty much everything that he wants. Uh, that's a really good point. That's what I was thinking. It's like, is this their short list or is this Daniel Craig's exactly. short list? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he like, I'll do it with <laughs> These three guys are like, I guess those are the options we have. I mean, I think with a Bond movie, I think it's a lot like if you're a sports league, you, you want to stay in the news cycle regardless of what's going on. So I think Bond is going to be fine either way. If Daniel Craig signs on, that's big news. If, if he doesn't, you get a new Bond, that's also big news. I think you want to find somebody that regardless of who is playing Bond is going to be taking this movie in a different direction than what we got with Spectre because it just felt a little dull and it felt a little like we've been here before and we need some more light into this franchise, and I think that Jan Demange might be a great choice to do that. So we'll see how that shakes out. In the meantime, there's another director who's kind of famous who might want to go back to one of his favorite properties. <laughs> who we got, Natasha? Just kind of famous. <laughs> Fans arguably believe that there are only two good Terminator movies, and they're the only two that come from that sort of famous director, James Cameron. With the Titanic director heading into production on Avatar 2 and 3, respectively, talk now has turned to the new Terminator movie that was announced back in January. That is Cameron returning to produce and Deadpool director Tim Miller signed on to Helm. Speaking about the project to News.com, Cameron revealed that he's not only envisioning one franchise reboot, but a whole trilogy. The question is, has the franchise run its course or can it be freshened up? So I'm in discussions with David Ellison, who is the current rights holder globally for the Terminator franchise and the rights in the U.S. market, revert to me under U.S. copyright law in a year and a half. So he and I are talking about what we can do. Right now, we are leaning toward doing a three-film arc and reinventing it. Clark, what do you think of a trilogy of a rebooted of rebooted Terminator movies. I think uh, this is clearly all news to me because I was just asking that. Wait, what? Um, <laughs> so, okay, here's the thing. I, I think that uh, Cameron 
when he is involved as a producer, and I mean actually involved as a producer, that is probably the best I, best hopes for this franchise because James Cameron is not making a lot of movies as a director, right? And he's clearly tied up in Avatar, but the fact that he has shown an interest in coming back to the property and being more involved, I think is a really good sign. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I actually think that something like Terminator would do better on television. Um, I know we had Sarah Connor, Sarah Connor Chronicles, yeah. but yeah, and and I think that was an example of a show that might have been ahead of its time. Um, mm. And so I think that maybe you know, while perhaps someone like James Cameron is more comfortable working in the feature film space, maybe they should start thinking about other kinds of media. And maybe if you had a really um, a, a big budget. Uh, television series that might be the way to go but ultimately I think I think all it takes is one good Terminator movie for fans to be excited again it, it only takes one good one but to get to that one yeah. we've been waiting a <laughs> long time and the first thing I'll say is this is that I don't you could be James Cameron a ultra famous director you could be Jan Dimanche you could be a 14 year old kid with your Samsung Galaxy all directors out there please stop taking these pictures <laughs> stop framing up yourself when well, we get it you're a visionary okay we understand that that. The camera guy taking the picture is very confused as to what you're doing. So please stop that. We get it. You make movies. Now, is James Cameron doing this, Jeremy? The, the guy has his... <laughs> don't, don't you dare do that. Don't you dare frame yourself up. He is just one of these guys who you root for him because he's just so passionate about the projects that he created, whether it's Avatar or it's Terminator. And I love those first two Terminator movies, but I'm just so sick of hearing about Terminator reboots. And Tim Miller would be a very interesting choice to direct a new Terminator. And there's a lot of directors that I think could have a cool take and reboot this thing entirely. But I just don't know if I have any more room in my heart for more Terminator movies because I've been let down so much. And I think that if you want wanted to reboot this property, the sad reality is that you might want to wait 5, 10, 15 years before we do this again, just to give us time to cleanse our palate from all of the Jenny Smith crap that we've got recently. I, I don't disagree with you. And yeah, James Cameron, we always want to root for him because he was like, he was the man in the 80s and 90s, you know? I mean, even... I mean, even I loved Avatar. I just watched it recently. I was like, okay, let's watch Avatar with these new goggles. I watched it. I was like, I don't get the hate. I enjoyed the hell out of it. You know, <laughs> I, it's, just, it's just the way it is. The soundtrack's great. The visuals are great. I, I like that. I just liked it. Um, but he also isn't the whole thing like he didn't go to film school. So he comes out swinging. He has a fever dream, which was probably a little more than fever about a metal skeleton rising from the. <laughs> and then he makes Terminator. It was really it's like the man literally brought his dreams to life. That's why I love the guy. He's one of the best out there. I love the fact that we were just talking about Denny Villeneuve's already doing Dune. He can't do that one other movie. James Cameron's doing five avatars. Maybe he'll do Terminator. So he's got to he's passing the buck off to somebody. He's probably going to be a producer. He's not going to direct this thing. But, yeah, another Terminator movie after we got a remake wool and then a reboot that was supposed to reboot the remake wool that didn't really land, so they're going to reboot the reboot that was a reboot to the remake wool. It, it gets a little confusing. I'm one of those people. I'm like, there are two good, there are two great Terminator movies, and then there's other. I don't like any of the other ones. I would like to see another Terminator movie if they could pull it off. But for me, at the end of two, it ends, right? Like, I, it has its wrap-up, so I'm not left hanging going, oh, what happened next? Uh, but I, I think for another Terminator movie, we don't need a cool one. We just need a smart one. We just It needs to be smart because in the end, Terminator was very, very smart and it laid groundwork while it hit it home. It set up a sequel without the first movie being a setup for a sequel. It was a, it was a very fulfilling thing in its own. I think Clark makes a good point because I like Sarah Connor Chronicles and I think it might have been ahead of its time. Just bring that back. Just bring back Sarah Connor Chronicles, Fox. Lena Headey's not busy or yeah, anything. She's, <laughs> right? In about a year and a half, she'll be free. <laughs> Heck, at the end of this season, she might be free. We don't know. That's the, maybe by next week she might be free. We don't know we what's going to happen know. on Game of Thrones. But Riley, you know, back in the old days before you had everything wireless with your television, you had fat back TVs and you'd plug in your Nintendo and your cable box and all these things and all these wires would go plug into one source and you'd look back there after six months of installing it and all the wires are all crossed and it's all confusing. And this is what Terminator feels like right now. So is the guy that originally plugged in all those wires the one that's going to be able to guide somebody else to come back in and just sort through everything or is it just just a jumbled mess and we should probably move. 
I just want to comment on that description. That metaphor that you just created is the greatest thing I have ever heard. I am the Robert Frost of 80s technological I, poetry. I think you made the perfect description of what this franchise is. And um, I, I really don't know what to think. I think on one hand, you have James Cameron, who has been talking about Terminator every time he sits down for an interview. And you get something different every time. So I love James Cameron, but I can't trust a single thing he's saying. Because one, he said that Terminator Genesis is a fantastic return to the franchise and that he loved it. And then we saw that piece of shit. And I'm like, what? And then if you go, I've been looking for it, but in the report that I got on this when I was creating the show notes, he said that he just said that about Terminator Genesis to support his friend Arnold. So for me, that's like, what? Why are you, so why are you blowing smoke up our ass for your friend. I don't get that. So, but then on the other hand, it's James Cameron and it's Tim Miller, who I have great respect for, who I love his Deadpool. And if he is going to sign on for a Terminator movie, and then we go back to, again, James Cameron talking, and he's saying there's so much technology out there with drones and with hack and with, uh, you know, the internet and all these different things in today's society that you can kind of put into a more gritty, realistic, grounded Terminator, which I don't know how you can do that. That interests me as well. But there is too much going on in this franchise. Like you said, all the crossed wires behind the fat pack TV that I do believe what you said, Mark, let the franchise take a breather for 10 years maybe, might work. Clark, I like your point. I think it could work on Netflix or on Amazon or on Hulu or even an HBO. That would be really cool to see some kind of uh, series like that. But I think I'm leaning towards let Terminator just stop for a while Let's revisit in a few years. It's an odd thing because as a kid, one of my favorite theatrical experiences of all time was sneaking in to see Terminator 2, <laughs> and it was because I was not allowed to go see that movie. And so watching good. it on the big screen, it, it blew my mind, and it made me really interested in film. I love those two movies a lot more than I love Avatar. But if I had the choice mm -hmm. between James Cameron focusing on either more Avatar movies or more Terminator movies, I'm taking Avatar. Mm -hmm. I just think that we're too far down the road with Terminator, and I just I, I, I don't see us going back anytime soon. Now, Natasha, I'm about to say a sentence to you okay. that I never thought I would say to anybody in my entire wow. life. I'm ready. <clears throat> I'm so ready. So Natasha, yes. Patrick Stewart voices a turd who's the father <laughs> to a young poop. Tell us about it. <laughs> Too good. Well, Mark, it's everyone's most anticipated movie of the year. Oh. It's the Emoji Movie, and it's coming out this week. <laughs> Hidden inside a smartphone, the bustling city of Textopolis is home to all emojis. Each emoji has only one facial expression, except for Gene. Determined to become normal like the other emojis, Gene enlists the help of his best friend High Five and a notorious code breaker called Jailbreak. During their travels through the other apps, the three emojis discover a great danger that could threaten their phones very existence. Okay, well, I did not get a chance to check out the Emoji Movie, much to my frowny face chagrin, because <laughs> maybe this could be the next Lego movie, or it could be another Smurfs or some more just like bad product placement movie. Uh, I do know some people that saw the Emoji Movie. We had a screening last night. I was busy doing the Schmoes Live show. Uh, Jeremy, they're under embargo. I am not, and their faces were not exactly what I would say, the one with the two hearts in the eyes. It was a lot more along the lines of the, uh, the nervous emoji, or dare I say, the dreaded chocolate pudding emoji. Yeah, this sounds like this sounds like closer to the next Terminator movie if they don't get their shit together. Um, I didn't see it either because I had a choice of driving across town and watching it, or sitting staring at my wall, TV, whatever, and doing literally nothing. I chose that second one. But I will watch it this weekend because yeah, I should because people ask me, what do you do for a living? I'm like, I'm a garbage man. I, I watch <laughs> garbage and then I shit all over it on YouTube for you fine folks. So I'll do it. I'll watch it. Um, just this is what I do for you. <laughs> OK, if you're a garbage man out there, please don't poop on the actual garbage. You can just take it and then put it in the big thing. I thought that's what garbage meant. No, no, no. Oh, your jobs are so much different than I thought for all these years. <laughs> Mark Riley, mm. the Emoji Movie. How excited are you? Not excited at all, my friend. I am don't really want to see this. Uh, unless, Jeremy, this is a prequel to Terminator and the Emoji Tell Movie you. is actually the start of Skynet. That's what it is. I, I, I have <laughs> zero. I've seen the trailers. I just, I mean, Patrick Stewart, I love his voice work mm -hmm. when he comes in on Family Guy and on American Dad. He's hilarious. But I just don't see him. I mean, they're all handcuffed by a 
did what is this G or PG? I don't know. Does the does the poop put it up to a PG rating? I, I yeah. I just it's going to be handcuffed with uh, you know it's for kids. It looks that way. Uh, I'm already hearing things that you know. You go emoji movie. Well, I said the same thing with Lego movie, and look how that turned out. So maybe I don't know, but I I will I will I will let the garbage <laughs> man do his thing, and then I'll decide when, whether. When I'm the em- see this. when the embargo for the movie lifts an hour before the movie actually comes out for the public, that's a sign. That it's is a big sign. Not a good sign. I will say that I, I thought the first trailer to the Emoji movie had some promise where we see, oh, somebody's different than everybody else, and they got to teach the kiddies a nice little lesson and maybe a little bit like Monsters, Inc., where you feel ostracized from your own community, so you have to forge a new path. All that stuff is fine. Patrick Stewart, I love. T.J. Miller is a really funny comedian. I think he's great in a lot of the stuff that he does. I just don't know if you have an opportunity to shine in a movie like this. Natasha, the Emoji movie to you, is that something that you're willing to spend upwards of $14 to go see. Absolutely not. <laughs> Even I, who love pretty much all animated movies, I, I thought this movie already came out and it was over. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. It's like I'm seeing posters and I'm like, dang, it's not done yet? Like, I'm ready for this to go. Bye-bye. All uh, right. <laughs> d- 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 I have plenty of opportunities left. Wendy, let's see if you want to go see the emoji movie. Look, I use plenty of mo- emojis you know, when I text mm-hmm. and uh, I love that Patrick Stewart is voicing the poop emoji, but... <laughs> I am not handing over any of my money for this movie. I'm sorry. I'm just not into it. And I love that, Natasha, you thought that it was I already happened. Thought it was forgotten done. before I got here. <laughs> All right, then let's turn it over to Classy Clark Wolf. You are the last champion that the Emoji Movie could have. You want to go see it? Ooh, uh, no. <laughs> uh, and Riley, I love, the idea, I love the idea of a hard PG. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, a, that's a hard PG rating. <laughs> yeah, it's like... <laughs> I no, <laughs> you know, I think I think if they were smart, this would be like a U2 album situation where you just wake up on Friday and the movie's in your phone. Yeah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> that is perfect. I always liked that one. <laughs> Um, no, I, this is not, this is, I I actually think the concept is not horrible of like, you know, there's so many different characters you could play with, but it just looks like a real, uh, obvious cash grab. I'm actually going to go see Girls Trip, uh, this weekend because I haven't seen it yet. Mm -hmm. Comic-Con like took over my life and I've been hearing great, great things about it. So I'm going to go see Girls Trip. Yeah. The two that I missed, uh, (laughs) from Comic-Con were Valerian and Girls Trip and I need to check both of them out. Uh, because my good friend Tiffany Haddish getting great reviews in Girls Trip. So I can't wait to see that one. And that's probably what I'll spend my money on this weekend and not the Emoji Movie. Sorry. Sorry. All right, let's move on to buy or sell. This is the part of the show where Natasha's going to give us a premise. We simply say whether we buy it or sell it even harder than we sell the Emoji Movie. What's (laughs) up first? StarWars.com announced yesterday that Trek and How to Train Your Dragon composer John Powell has been tapped to score the untitled Young Han Solo movie. Also known for his composing on the Matt Damon Bourne series as well as Kung Fu Panda, the London native earned an Academy Award nomination for his score on How to Train Your Dragon. The press release from Lucasfilm states that the Han Solo movie will be scored in the style of the original Star Wars movies, but will still retain Powell's distinctive voice. The untitled Young Han Solo movie, directed by Ron Howard, is set to hit theaters on May 25th, 2018. Riley, buy or sell John Powell, scoring the Young Han Solo movie. Well, I just cashed in my 401k to buy this thing. I am so excited. This is the story that grabbed my attention because... John Powell is one of the best composers out there. And if you were on my Twitter feed yesterday, I shared a number of clips from How to Train Your Dragon, which is some of the best composing out there. He was nominated for an Oscar. I highly recommend. You're going to fall in love with that score. That score I put on when I'm cleaning, when I'm writing, when I'm just walking around the office. Walking around the office. I walked out holding my phone. (laughs) And I said, listen to this, Ellis. And you're like, what am I listening to? I just couldn't be happier. I know it's not, it's not a sexy name like a Hans Zimmer or a Giacchino or a or Giacchino. I don't know. Um, or even... Demange. Uh, uh, Demange. <laughs> Mackenzie. <laughs> Mackenzie. <laughs> David. But I, I, I highly recommend, because first you hear Shrek, and he composed Shrek, and you're like, I, I, you know, nothing sticks with me with that score, to be honest. He did the entire Bourne series. Um, He's done so many things, but it's the How to Train Your Dragon score where you go and then you hear what they say that you're going to get you're going to get the Star Wars themes, you know, like um, uh, Rogue One did. You're going to hear little nods, but he's going to bring his unique flair and he does have it. And that's because of How to Train Your Dragon. It's all there. Highly recommend. Listen to it now. 
Yeah, Clark, I'm interested in your take as well because you're somebody who may not have the How to Train Your Dragon score on your phone like some other people on the panel do. <laughs> Nerd. And also because the Han Solo movie, I think much more so even than Rogue One, is going to be a departure from the classic Star Wars scores that we know because there's no Jedi Knights, there's no Skywalkers in here to really glom on to. So what do you think about this choice for the new Han Solo movie? I actually think it makes a whole lot of sense. Now, granted, I am not uh, an aficionado like my Schmodown partner over here, but right I on, think partner. that... Uh, when you when you combine um, his his history, right? So you have some more family friendly movies, but you also have things like the Bourne movies. That actually sounds like the perfect combination for a young Han Solo movie. Something that's fun and it's an adventure, uh, and the, but it's not necessarily just for children. And so I think that that's it. Actually, makes great sense. So I buy it. I'm really excited for it. That's right, and, and it's the first piece of news we've heard from the Han Solo movie since we had all the debacle last month about the reshoots and the firing of directors and editors and. Rod Howard coming on board and everybody pushing their schedules all around. So I think it's good news in the right direction. I think that I still echo a lot of people's sentiments out there where you're very nervous about what the tone of the Han Solo movie is, how much of what we had Lord and Miller shoot can we salvage, what is Ron Howard doing to right the ship here in the eyes of Lucasfilm. But Jeremy, at least for somebody scoring the movie, I, I think this seems like a good choice to me. I like that they're going to people who have a similar flair for the dramatic in fun movies like what you get with either a Shrek or more recently, How to Train Your Dragon. So it's a buy for me. Well said, Mark Ellis. I call the Han Solo movie the great school bus fire of 2017. Like, <laughs> it, it really was just... At the, I was like, I can't look forward to that until I get more information. Not a lot of new information, though Ron Howard is tweeting some stuff out, and he's making it a lot of fun. But this, all right, this score, I'm with you, Riley, on the How to Train Your Dragon score. I, wouldn't, I worked at the movie theater when that movie came out. I would volunteer. I was a projectionist. I didn't have to clean the theaters, but I would help because the end credits were still playing, and it was just good music to listen oh, to. Oh, you, you know? projectionist, I'm up on you. your high horse in uh, your ivory tower up there with your godlike complex if i show the movies or you don't see them at all the, the talkies we call them the talkies i was Mark. one of the grunts i had to go clean i did concessions and i had to go clean i was there for I never made it to projectionist we helped you out i didn't smoke that there, much weed there's still time <laughs> there is still time the potheads, for sure the totally weed right. heads. Yeah. uh but i if this dude only ever did chopsticks on the xylophone for his entire filmography and then was like oh but i did how to train your dragon i'll be like buy hard buy because mm -hmm. it's a great soundtrack i agree with you clark his uh, his style is the perfect mix of whimsy and fun yet also get real serious with barn so buy for sure you know what i think that if uh you and i could be in like that scene from big except with a giant xylophone and we get two big things to hit it with you and i could play chopsticks like robert loja and tom hanks yeah, we, we probably that's, could not play how to train your dragon but we could rock that chopstick. that's right we'd have fun <laughs> so we get in a fight over the projectionist over here all right let's move on to our last buy or sell of the day what's up Deadline is reporting that Jared Leto is in talks for the title character in Sony Pictures' Bloodshot, the adaptation of the comic from Valiant Entertainment. The story centers on a mob killer named Angelo Mortelli who enters the witness protection program. When he is betrayed by a handler, he becomes part of a secret experiment to create the ultimate killing machine by having his memories erased and injected with microscopic computers called nanites. Now, as an unstoppable force, Mortelli tries to rediscover who he was while battling both the mob and the police. Directed by visual effects, Supervisor Dave Wilson, who will partner with Tim Miller's Blur Studios, the movie has yet to secure a release date. Jeremy, buy or sell, buy or sell Jared Leto and Bloodshot. Uh, I don't know if it's Leto or Leto, but Jared Leto. Um, all right, so I'm buying it. <laughs> but here's the thing about the dude's a great actor. He's a good actor. Like he won an Oscar, and we've seen it happen. We've seen him be good. Uh, and then somehow he got it in his head that being a good actor means being total meta and mailing condoms and rats to people, and that makes for a good character. And it, it does. And then he overcooked it as a Joker. If you're gonna be that crazy, you gotta nail it. You gotta stick that landing. <laughs> He didn't do that. Um, and then you see him in the uh, the Blade Runner trailer, and you're like, I don't know. Are you overcooking it again? That might totally work, but I don't know. Um, I still have faith in the dude. I really do. So I'm buying that. And the premise sounds interesting. I think he's a good choice for that premise. 
Um, and maybe this could be his redemption piece. We'll see. Yeah, I'm going to buy it for no other reason because it might be the movie that gets us away from those like creepy Jared Leto stories and we just like remember this guy's a really good actor who's got incredible range. I heard the name Bloodshot and I was like, that sounds a little familiar. Oh yeah, I used to collect those books when I was a really? kid with, because that was right at the explosion of the Valiant universe mm. in the early to mid 90s and Bloodshot was one of the forefront comics that you would get from Valiant. I mean, it was really cool and it had like a La Femme Nikita meets RoboCop kind of feel where you have somebody who is just such a badass killer, but they also had this past that they're desperately trying to remember. And so it was something that I really glommed on to. And if you're going to make this adaptation, I think you want somebody that is going to commit to the role and say whatever you want about Jared Leto thus far, Clark. The guy <laughs> makes an effort. He shows up, whether he's racing his Steve Prefontaine or he's as the Joker mailing crap to Margot Robbie. He tries on every movie he does. So I'm actually kind of excited for Bloodshot. It's a buy. I mean, um, that's fair. I don't I don't think I would ever argue that Jared Leto is not a great actor because they do. I think he is. Uh, but I also think that the, the theatrics have gotten to be a little much and they've overshadowed him as as an entertainer and a performer. And so for me, this is this the concept of Bloodshot sounds a little too high concept. I, I kind of just want him to pull back and just act. Like, do you know what I mean? Gotcha, like, yeah. I kind of just want to see him in something that's a little more straightforward. Um, and so this one's a sell for me. You mm. want to see the, like, just like the strip down, like, like, like acoustic Leto set. That's you don't right. want to see, like, the yes. big rock production. Yeah. You just want to see For 30 him. seconds to Mars, I want them to be just like, yeah, with their <laughs> MTV's unplugged and, mm -hmm. and, you know, still still bringing it, but just a little more chill. Like, bongos, maybe, in the background. <laughs> like Go back that. to Requiem for a Dream exactly. style, you know, like, give us a power piece. Uh, Mark Riley, you mm. are the final say here on the table. Well, uh, it's a term I coined last week, but I'm window shopping on this right now because I, I don't have enough information. I'm looking in the window and I'm like, oh, that looks nice. Huh. Okay, so you got your, <laughs> you got Jared Leto. Just because you write the show notes doesn't mean you can alter the game of buy or yeah. sell. Yeah, I okay? can. Buy it. Yeah, I can. Can or I? Sell it. Okay. I will. I will. Uh, I will tentatively. Uh, fuck, I'm gonna sell it. Keep the receipt. <laughs> keep the receipt. <laughs> if you keep the receipt. Yeah, uh. I, I, you know, I just, it's hard for me to really get behind this because of, I'm not too familiar with the, uh, the source material, but you have uh, a, a, a new director, you have Sony that's trying to push a new universe, and they're, they're already saying, I want a shared universe, and we're creating it now, and in, in the pre-production meeting, it's like, you, you, just focus on the movie first, and with what he, with uh, what Jared Leto is doing right now, I... I'm unsure of if he's going back to the Joker. I don't know what's going on with Suicide Squad or Gotham City Sirens and all these things because I really liked his Joker. He was just in a really bad movie, so I'm hoping he does more Joker and not this because all the reports I'm reading are saying that he is such a huge comic book fan. Mm -hmm. So that gives me some hope. But his huge comic book fandom, I want to be all focused on the Joker and I want to see that blossom into something because, I, again, I really enjoyed it. With this, again, I, it's Sony is trying to do this shared universe with Spider-Man villains, with no Spider-Man, and now this. So it's just adding to the weight of so many comic book movies and studios trying to rush a shared universe that it doesn't give me a lot of faith. So I'm going to reluctantly sell because I can't window shop. <laughs> no, there's no window shopping. I'll cover it for you today. I'll put it on my Diners Club card. Thank you. Well, we want to remind you guys, and speaking of comic books, we have a newer show here on Collider Video's YouTube channel called Comic Book Shopping with John Schnepp. And this week, his special guest is none other than Mr. Tim Miller, everybody. They went out and they shopped for some comic books, and Schnepp had a blast. So did Tim Miller, apparently. So you guys can check that out right now. And speaking of John Schnepp, his show Heroes that he does here used to be weekly, and now they're doing it daily this week. So you get a little daily morsel of good Good heroes awesomeness every day this week. I said awesomeness. I did not forget about you, Jeremy Johns. Awesome Tacular is Jeremy's show. You guys can find it new every week on Go90. You can check out the link to the latest vids description in this thing. I put those words together in any way you want. Let's also talk about the movie trivia showdown match that's happening tomorrow between Little Evil JTE and Ken the Pit Boss Knapsack. Here's a quick look.
I'll tell you this. I think Knapsack's going to give him a game, but if there's one person that does not lack for confidence in movie trivia, <laughs> it's JTE. <laughs> sure. uh, we also are going to have Jedi Council. An all-new episode is going to drop a little bit later on today here on Collider Video. And there's a really cool contest right now. If you guys are fans of the movie Dunkirk or Christopher Nolan, you can win a whole bunch of neat Dunkirk stuff, including an autographed Dunkirk poster, the IMAX poster signed by Christopher Nolan, and a whole lot of other Dunkirk goodies. Just enter the contest. More in the link in this vid's description or on Collider.com. So make sure y'all check that out. Now, again, we're going to remind you guys at the end of this show, we're going to save some time for your live Twitter questions. So go ahead and start tweeting us right now at Collider Video. Wendy's the gatekeeper, so probably don't tell her how much you want to go see the Emoji Movie. In the meantime, we're going to move on to Mailbag. This is the part of the show where we hear from you guys. CollidervideO at gmail.com is the email to send it into. Sometimes we'll answer on Movie Talk. Other times we'll answer on our weekend show's Mailbag. Natasha, the red flag is up. What All we right. Got? Well, speaking on Christopher Nolan, Christy writes, I read an interview with Christopher Nolan the other day in which he criticized Netflix for not supporting theatrical films because they want to simultaneously stream them upon release. One, do you agree with his comments? And two, do you believe sooner or later that all movies will be released in theaters and on streaming in the future? Thanks for pondering my questions. Well, when this article originally came out, this interview that Christopher Nolan had these comments, it, w it, it turned into a whole firestorm on Twitter as a lot of things tend to do. And I think a little bit of it got blown out of proportion, but I also will answer your question and say, no, I don't agree with Christopher Nolan that, he, that you, you should be concerned about Netflix streaming movies the same time they open in theaters because you have options and those are always good for the consumer. And you also have multiple ways to spend your money on content. And if it costs you less to stay at home and watch something on Netflix, you may not get the incredible surround sound and the overwhelming visuals of being in the theater, but you also save a lot of money and people like Christopher Nolan who can say I want to go to the theater every day and watch this there's a lot of other people that may not have that kind of opportunity so you pay your seven or your ten dollars for a monthly Netflix subscription and you get to see a lot of cool stuff I don't have a problem with that there is always going to be a place to go to the movies there's always going to be a place in our hearts for the theater experience and actually I will say something like Dunkirk is a great theater experience and if you go see four or five movies in the entire year, I would say Dunkirk should be one of the ones that you go see in the theater because it's that incredible to witness on a giant scale. But, Clark, I wholeheartedly disagree with the notion that the consumer should be handcuffed even when you have all these streaming platforms that could be showing a movie at the same time it's out in theaters. I like to have options. How do you feel? Yeah, I mean, it's also not entirely true either. Like, Beasts of No Nation was a Netflix original movie that Carrie Fukunaga directed, and mm -hmm. they, that did get a theatrical release. Netflix absolutely put that in the theater. So I just think that, you know, it, it's, it's easy for um, A-list filmmakers to sit in a a very um, cushy position and say this is how movie going should be but the truth of the matter is if you live in a t if you live outside New York LA Atlanta Chicago you don't have access to these things necessarily and going to a theater and we've talked about it a million times here going to a theater is an expensive experience especially if you have a family so um, I think you know it, it's it, we would all love to be able to be treated to the cinematic of experience of seeing things in 35 70 millimeter or with, with, you know, IMAX quality uh, sound and visuals. But unfortunately, that's just not realistic for the majority of the movie-going audience. I think, isn't the statistic that most people only see, like, two movies in a theater a year or mm -hmm. something, like, something that? like that? I mean, that, unfortunately, is the economic reality. So I just think, you know... It's 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 a bit um, it's a bit out of touch. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Jeremy, you are a projectionist, and you guys are known for being <laughs> out of touch and elitist in your thinking when it comes to movies. Do you think that Christopher Nolan has a point here with movies being released in theaters the way that the filmmaker dreamed of everybody witnessing it, or that we should be able to see it on VOD at the same time? Well, I think that all depends on the filmmaker. I think if you are a director who's filming in seventy millimeter, your vision is well, this should be in the movie theater and and into that I agree that that movie should be released in theaters should be released in IMAX and maybe that's how you should go see it that's great uh, but there are other movies that lend themselves to being like if Hell or High Water came out on Netflix the same moment it came out in the theater I don't think there'd be a lot lost in watching it on Netflix because most people have a, a TV screen that's around 40 something inches well you know what I mean like I, in the 90s I would kill for a screen that big you know what I mean so 
Roger Ebert kind of hypothesized at one point that there would be a time when all movies would be released to home and a streaming service of some sort, and the movie theater would be reserved for kind of a, a special presentation. They'd have the curtains raised, and you get the 5.1. Now, I don't think people were filming in IMAX when he said that, but now we'll say, oh, for the IMAX aspect ratio, that's what you pay to go see, and then you can just see the movie in its scope or flat aspect ratio at home if you so choose to do that. So I think the world is kind of a little different than Ebert thought but or thought it would go, but he definitely was close, the fact that we're having that discussion right now. Uh, but I agree with Clark that to say, like, that should not happen, that is a little out of touch to someone who's like, I, I'm a millionaire. I can pay for movies every week. It's like a lot of people can't. So I think yeah, bringing that to the people... Um, isn't a bad thing, you know. It's That's, just a different marketing. It, thing. It, no, you 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 hit the nail on the head right there because a lot of people aren't millionaires and some people just like to window shop, like Mark Riley. <laughs> so, what do you say about Nolan's comments? Where you stand? Well, you know, I, I see his point. I think he's really what he's really saying is he wants you to experience his IMAX, his movies on the big screen. And if Netflix were to release it at home, he's afraid you're not going to get the full experience that he's trying to give you. However, then I look to Ava DuVernay, who goes on Twitter and goes against him and says, listen, some people can't get to the theater. Everybody's kind of mentioned it here. Some people can't get to the theater to see 13th, my documentary that I put so much love and attention to. So there they are at home. They're able to get it right there. And that's Ava DuVernay's thing. She made it so everybody can see it. So it's a case-by-case -case basis. Now, if we get to a point where Star Wars is going to be released in theaters and at home, I personally am going to the theater opening night. That's me. Now, if somebody's at home, they can't get there, and they want their Star Wars, and it's right there for them, why should we stop them? Why, why should we say, no, you got to go to the theater? I, I personally, I don't want that yet. I think there are case by case, there are movies like Bright. Bright is a movie that I really want to see. David Ayer's fantasy, gritty cop drama, thriller, whatever it is, with Joel Edgerton and Will Smith. That looks phenomenal. I want to see that in the theater because that's my type of movie, but it's going to be there for the people at home, and that's the choice. That's what Netflix is doing. That's what I like, but again, case by case. I get what Nolan's saying. I don't agree with it. I think it's fine. Do what you want. In the future, though, I think we're headed there. I think that sooner or later we're going to get both options. Right. It, it, it's like that, the Infinity War trailer that not a lot of people have seen yet, where I got to experience it in Hall H and just have this great sound system. When that gets released to the public, you're going to have the option of waiting until you see it in a the movie theater or looking at it on your computer or watching it on your phone. Now, I would suggest, hey, don't watch that thing on your phone. Wait until you can at least get your computer screen in front of you and put on some headphones and immerse yourself in this awesome trailer. But I'm also not going to condemn you for getting excited and wanting to watch it on your your phone because you may not have the time and you want to get this thing watched ASAP. So I think that we just have to be careful about crossing that line of demarcation where you're now telling people how to experience the movie. You can make suggestions. And if you're the filmmaker, you're an artist, you put your life's work into this. You can tell them how you think that they should experience it. But when you're telling other people that oh, you can't go experience it this way because you're not getting everything, I think that's a little unfair to do to some human beings. But maybe that's just me. And I've been drinking since 9 a.m. Let's wow. move on to Twitter. This is the part of the show where Wendy is going to hear from you guys right now and then tell us what you said. Wendy, are they being nice today on Twitter? They're being very nice today, and this one comes from Albert Rodriguez, who writes, with so many of his properties redone, what other Stephen King adaptation would you like to see remade? For me, it would be Christine. Mm. Ooh, Christine Good. would be interesting. A very evil car. First saw the movie in the early 80s, and then uh, that's when it... Uh, just kind of got lost in the shuffle of all the other Stephen King adaptations that were coming out, most of which weren't that great. I mean, you look at his work is amazing, and then the adaptations into the big screen, it's not always The Shining. And he even didn't like The Shining. So I would say Salem's Lot. I want to see a good Ooh, version nice. of Salem's oh, Lot. Just, That's, yeah. That, that, because there, there's bad versions of Salem Lot. There's really, really bad yeah. versions of Salem's Lot. I want to see a good one. The one property I would say do not touch is Pet Cemetery because I think that is still perfect, and I don't, I don't know that you can make that movie any scarier. Well, then I'm gonna, I'm gonna counterpoint you because I actually want to see a remake of or a new version of Pet Cemetery because Guillermo del Toro has said that that's a Stephen King adaptation that he wants to take on. Whoa, whoa. 
And if, right. and if I had a Guillermo del Toro uh, Pet Cemetery movie, I got to be on board with that. Mm. But I, so while Mark mm. ponders this, uh, the other thing I want to tell you guys is in addition to uh, It coming, which I'm very excited about, uh, Mike Flanagan, who did Oculus and uh, did Ouija Origin of Evil, has, and um, what's the one where she's at home in her house and she can't hear? Uh, Hush, thank you. Uh, Cobster from way downtown. Thank you, Cobster. <laughs> so anyway, uh, his adaptation of Gerald's Game is nice. coming to Netflix yeah. this, this year. And this is a movie that, or a book that Stephen King, his thought was not adaptable uh, because if you know the content, it's pretty racy and risque but netflix did it king has said that he loves it and i can't wait to see that one mark riley i'm giving you the keys to stephen king's vault what adaptation do we need to see uh mm -hmm. i'm gonna see your salem's lot uh and raise you the tommy knockers oh. uh that's <laughs> that was a good uh mini series again salem's lot they did an old movie and then a t and then a mini series again or a tv series i can't remember <laughs> love salem's lot but tommy mm -hmm. knockers is uh have you read that book anyone here at the panel that shit crazy Buried UFO. I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah. Buried UFO starts to turn people into like their minions to build a something for the, just read the book. Let's see a movie of that. I would love to see a movie that's not really a remake. It's kind of like what it, what, what we're getting with it. So that would be my choice. Jeremy, I want to see a kid friendly version of the Tommy Knockers where it turns them into little yellow beings and they put on denim overalls and yeah, they I just talk in really funny voices. <laughs> and have poop there emojis. Yeah. I think that would uh, I think that would not work in any any <laughs> realm of reality that the Tommy Knockers may or may not be from. I think if it lands, I think there's going to be a whole wave of, hey, let's do some new Stephen King stuff. I think uh, the Dark Tower, longer than 90 minutes, would probably be a good start. Um, I agree <laughs> with you on Salem's Lot because there's <laughs> some... Barlow is such a great thing. Mm -hmm. He's such a great vampire, and that whatever seventies monstrosity they had being Poor him was, Toby Hooper. was not. <laughs> yeah, it was know. not Barlow. Uh, so I think uh, Needful Things. Riley and I were talking oh, about yeah. that before uh, before yeah. we started. That's it's one of the best books I've ever read. It's so good. They made a Needful Things movie with Max von Sydow yeah. and, uh, and Ed Harris. It, yeah. Not bad at all. Uh, but I I would like to see where they can go where they can go now, you know? So I, uh, I'm going to say Needful Things just on the basis that eh, it's one of my faves. What was the town of Needful? It was a Castle Rock. Castle Rock. It was the last Castle Rock. Uh, that's a little movie trivia. Hey. Down Baby there. Carrots. Yeah. Still got it. <laughs> the last Castle Rock Woo. story. Mm. All right. Well, that is going to do it here today for us on Collider Movie Talk. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thank you to our entire panel back there working very hard on the mic. You guys all, when I do my, uh, when I get my home theater and I get that like box that like just brings theatrical release movies to your house, you guys can all come over and watch him for ten dollars except dennis who now pays 25 dollars for his lack of support for my concession <laughs> charges mark riley where can the kids find you you can find me at riley around on twitter and instagram jeremy johns when you're not seeing the emoji movie where can we check you out uh you can find me at jeremy johns on youtube twitter rest of the internet you can find my show awesome tacular on go 90 where ellis and i play some fun games throw some things at each other it's a <laughs> lot of fun you can find me hanging out in castle rock <laughs> we throw things at each other we get things thrown at both of us together and we oh, have yeah. to team up it's a great time. uh classy clark wolf where can everybody find you you can find me floating in the canals in Derry, maine <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> at clark wolf clark with a knee wolf with a knee and natasha martinez you guys can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Natasha Lexus underscore. And last but certainly not least, Wendy Lee Zaney. Where can we all find you? On Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. I am merely Mark Ellis. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to this episode of Collider Movie Talk. Dennis and the crew will be back tomorrow. I will see you guys on Monday. Until then, this has been a movie show. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.